Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Let's start off with the crypto currency market cap here. You can see that right now Ethereum is on an absolute tear. It's up 11.12%, putting its market cap over $20 billion. So Ethereum is now a $20 billion market cap compared to Bitcoin's $37 billion. Uh, that's really amazing. That's a you can see just in these little charts here that uh, Ethereum has already corrected, uh, snapped back from the correction that Bitcoin took and is on the verge of going into new highs. That correction is is already over for Ethereum, and uh, you can see just from the chart here that all of these kind of corrected at the same time. All these charts look the same, and that's what we saw um, the night of my last video uh, when Bitcoin corrected. I'm going to show you what happened to my position, which was kind of shocking because I ended up falling asleep uh, watching the market. Um, but so the total market cap here comes to 84 billion. I think the high that we hit was 90 billion, and we're already coming back up to there. We actually dropped down to 60 billion total market cap from 90, and now we're back to 83. So the big question is going to be, is this, uh, is this correction over with? Uh, well, we're getting close to the type of territory where we can get that second leg down. Um, but it's starting to look a lot more like one of these. So we could go to $5,000. I mean, we the correction here was from $2,700 um, down to $1,800. That's actually a pretty big percentage correction. But then again, uh, traditional bear markets in Bitcoin have stretched something like this length here, and that would at least take us back to, I'm looking at around here, 1400 for support. Now what's interesting is that as I told you I was, uh, I showed you my buy stops I'd put in and the thing that's really shocking here is the performance of USDT versus Bitcoin. You can see that we reached a low that night of 1545. Now I fell asleep when this happened, and but I had buy stops in it. Uh, I believe they were 1,800, 1,700, 1,600, and they were weighted higher as as it went down. So I ended up getting bought in on this spike, which pretty much saved my position because I had been scaling in buys here. I obviously started my scaling in too early, so I pretty much covered my position there and ended up roughly even, uh, and then uh, went a little bit long in here, but still have some USDT. So the big question is why did USDT do this? Well, I did a lot of research on it and there was a crisis in USDT back in May where it was, the whole goal is to be pegged one for one to the dollar and it actually decayed down to about 93, 92 cents. It's actually back up now to a, a dollar six. So USDT now is worth more than a dollar but there's been tremendous inflows of uh, money into it and the, the amount of shares have increased dramatically. So I'm keeping my eye really closely on USDT. Uh, if USDT were to go under, and it's, it's a lot like SLV, it's, it's not really redeemable. So you have to question um, you know, if it's possible for it to go under. Uh, so you can see the changes across the board here, pretty crazy here. This is in USDT gains. They're not as extreme in Bitcoin gains, but you can see Ethereum up 31%, Next up 31%, Zcash up 22%. Uh, I was tempted to step in and buy some of these cryptos that were really smashed down. You can see Ethereum Classic, for example the low that it hit there. Zcash didn't go quite as low, uh, but you know it went all the way down to $122. Now it's up to $222. So a lot of these got slaughtered and they all get slaughtered at the same time. Uh, so it's a very risky game. You can see, look at Litecoin, it went all the way down to 15 bucks. It's now up to 24 bucks. 
So you know the saying, the time to buy is when the blood is running in the streets, but it can be very difficult to pull the trigger. Uh, so let's get over to uh, the silver futures here real quick. Um, this is just practically a dead market now. You can see that it's just kind of sitting here going sideways. It's back into an area that was in 2008. Uh, is it a great investment? Absolutely. It's, it's one of the most undervalued investments out there. But you have to remember that when things are at an insane level, then nothing that's real matters. And if you want to look at insanity here, let's go over to the indices and take a look at the NASDAQ 100. So the action in the NASDAQ since the uh, financial crisis, you can see that uh, we had the NASDAQ bubble here and uh, that actually now is starting to look tame in comparison. If you take out just this dip here uh, for the financial crisis and just uh, do a continuation, you're really looking at a 14 to 15 year bull market. Now this is unprecedented uh, and, and we're talking about a price move from a thousand in 2009 to where we're almost at six thousand. Now for cryptocurrencies that's nothing but for stock markets uh, that's a six-fold move and you can see now we're just kind of extending uh, up into this parabolic area. Uh, not relatively as sharp a rise as this one but still we're getting into that insanity type of rise. Now this is going to end badly. No one can say when it's going to end. A lot of people have been calling a top for a very long time. But when it does end, it's going to end very badly. It, it really looked like it was going to end here in 2016. And uh, just for a number of reasons, the main reason being that the people who are involved want to keep things going. Because as long as this is rising, uh, there's a lot of boats that are floating because of it. There's a lot of people's uh, investment income, retirement income, everything is riding on this and it's more and more just a few companies, Apple, Google and others. So they have a tremendous incentive to keep this bubble going. Uh, it's, it's really the only healthy thing, although it's not truly healthy, but it's the only seriously uh, positive thing about the economy is this bubble that we have in stocks and like I said it's gonna end badly. Uh, if we look over at the interest rate markets uh, the the top in bonds which had been called for for so long which looked like it was in now it doesn't look like it was in you can see here on the 30-year bond we're resuming an uptrend interest rates are still falling we're, we're still looking to kind of emulate the Japanese. The two-year note on the short end, yes, it's, it's come off those highs, but it, it still hasn't done anything like it did, you can see, back in 1998. You can see even in 2004, where you had a significant backup in interest rates. We've got nothing like that happening right now. And that's what creates these type of bubble stock uh, run-ups like we've had is, is extended low interest rates like this. Again, this has to end, but we don't know when. Now here's a perfect example of what happens when they can't keep things going. So this is what's going on in Puerto Rico right now. Puerto Rico is finally coming to the point where they're having to face reality. And when you live in an economy that really doesn't produce anything and the majority of your citizens are tax consumers rather than taxpayers, it's going to end badly. So let's look at what's happening in Puerto Rico. This is just a kind of a taste of what's coming. And uh, this is actually, it, this almost looks like something out of history here with this girl sitting here with a guitar, but this is, this is the front gate of the University of Puerto Rico shut down uh, they're blaming protesters. Maybe they don't even have any money. So let's read the story. 
The gates of the University of Puerto Rico are chained shut and festooned with protest signs and students' desks. Facing jail time for failing to reopen a school that students have shut down for nearly two months, the university president quit on Tuesday, the second to do so this year. So many members of the Board of Trustees resigned that the board no longer has the quorum required to hire a new boss. The accreditation of eight of the school's 11 campuses was put on probation late last week, and next year's admissions at the main Rio Piedras campus dropped 25%. The University of Puerto Rico has been a consistent source of pride, a place that educates many of the island's doctors, lawyers, and engineers at a cost that makes it attainable even for people from the humblest of backgrounds. So, big question, who's funding that cost? Now, the cascading financial crisis that forced Puerto Rico to declare a form of bankruptcy earlier this month also threatens to decimate its public university. The school receives 90% of its funding from a central government that cannot pay $123 billion in bond debt and pension obligations. A financial oversight board that runs Puerto Rico's affairs has said the company's university budget needs to be sliced by about half. That's what I've been saying for the longest time about the budget of the federal government. It needs to be sliced in half. It's going to happen one way or the other. It's happening now in Puerto Rico. The crisis is both imperiling its future and pitting students against one another, those keeping the institution closed versus those eager to resume their studies. University supporters say the cuts are jeopardizing an institution that helped Puerto Rico transform from an agrarian society dependent on sugar and tobacco into a modern middle-class society whose graduates are essential to rescuing the island from its fiscal quagmire. I would beg to differ <laughs> considering that they're pouring out probably a whole bunch of useless degrees. Uh, maybe it would be that uh, if they revived sugar and tobacco production on the island they might actually get some sort of uh, stable economy. But that's just my opinion. The University of Puerto Rico was the most important cultural and social project that Puerto Rico had in the 20th century, and it was going to continue being so in the 21st century, said Silvia Alvarez Cabello, a historian who published an anthology about the history of the university. I've been at the university for 30 years. I'll retire next year, and I've seen many of these movements. This is the worst. Because in previous events like this, there wasn't this feeling that everything is collapsing and there's no light at the end of the tunnel at all. Here's your students protesting, and you have to wonder what they're protesting. I think they're either protesting having to pay more for their tuition, because I know that they're talking about tuition increases, or maybe these are ones protesting that the other ones have shut the university down. Uh, my best guess is that these are people protesting that someone's not giving them free money. That's basically what these protests come down to, is that they want somebody else to give them their money. The University of Puerto Rico was founded in 1903 mostly as a place to educate teachers. It now has nearly 60,000 students across 11 campuses and, considered, and is considered the cradle of Puerto Rico's leftist thought. Really? That's surprising. Known affectionately as La UPI, UPR offers 452 degree-based programs, including 40 at the doctorate level, a medical school, and a law school. But tuition is just $56 a credit, so a full course load costs less than $1,700 a year. At least half the students are dependent on federal Pell Grants, meaning they pay no tuition at all and even get a subsidy for living expenses. Did you get that? This Every time we dig into the story in Puerto Rico, we find out that these people are living off the government. Whether it's government workers, uh, government uh, welfare, um, which is a huge number there, uh, the government retirement. So it's a really bad situation and it's only going to get worse. I'm not going to read any more of the story. Uh, here's some law students who are protesting the shutdown. I mean it just when things get to this point there isn't any money and you can argue and squabble all you want but uh, you know now the bondholders are being demonized for trying to get their money back. 
but it's certainly going to be the case that no one is going to loan them any more money. So they're going to have to find a way to come up with the money, uh, and it's just not going to happen. So Puerto Rico, in my opinion, Puerto Rico is just going to become a hellhole. And the best thing they could do is to kick all the liberals out of power, um, turn their economy around by just uh, allowing foreign investment, uh, reduce taxes, uh, maybe let sugar and tobacco come back. But this socialist, plan, socialist utopia plan of creating a bunch of people with degrees that nobody wants to hire, it's not working. And that is coming to America. The reason why it hasn't arrived yet, I already showed you that, is that the, as Andy Hoffman calls it, the, the Dow Propaganda Index, the, in this case it's the NASDAQ Propaganda Index, they are not going to let this thing go down until they've decided that uh, it's time for the big one. And this is by far the longest and strongest bull market in stocks, I think in history. Uh, I believe the 1980s market went into correction in 1987. And so it ran from roughly 82 because we had a recession. So that was about five years. So this just this leg here is the longest. But you add it to this other leg, um, we're talking about a crash, uh, a big crash. We're talking about a bear market that's going to go on for a long time. And people are going to start to wonder how they ever believed uh, that this could go on. Now, is the same ha happening in Bitcoin? I'm 50-50 right now. Uh, my history in Bitcoin tells me that uh, this right shoulder here is probably going to start going down again. Uh, and that makes trading in the alt currencies much more difficult. One of the things that's been difficult for me to trade and continue to make gains is that I tend not to uh, play with these altcoins uh, unless Bitcoin is either in a bull market or is in a sideways market. And the reason why is these coins are quoted in Bitcoin. So what that means is if Bitcoin is going down, even if these coins are staying at the same price, you're still losing money. But if Bitcoin is going down and these coins are going down at the same time against Bitcoin, then you're losing double. And I've shown you the charts. I can go through so many of these coins uh, this is what I'm playing right now, Prime Coin. But uh, if you look at, you know, Digibytes was on a tear, uh, and it it went down. It went down lower than Bitcoin went down. Uh, you could just go through these. Here's Lisk, uh, Strat, uh, just about all these charts. They, Ethereum, they went down even harder than Bitcoin went down. So until I'm convinced that we've either resumed a bull market or we've got stable sideways action. I'm probably not going to do a lot in this uh, alt space. And again, I'm still trying to get as much money as I can off of Poloniex. Um, we haven't seen a resumption of the lag. And so I'm leaning more towards their argument that it was their servers and uh, Ripple and the others that were on such a tear that they basically bogged down the servers. That story's starting to look more true, but I'm still very concerned about having much money on this exchange. Um, and I'm also concerned about USDT because you have to remember that these prices that are quoted for Bitcoin and for all these coins on Poloniex are not quoted in dollars, they're quoted in terms of USDT. And the reason for that is because they didn't want to deal with the regulations that having dollars uh, involves. They would have all kinds of extra FinCEN regulations, know your customer regulations, all kind of banking regulations. Whereas if they just trade these against a USDT price, which is just another cryptocurrency, they don't have to comply with all those regulations. So uh, I'm going to keep a close eye on you, USDT. I will update you on what I find out. But uh, I think the bull market in stocks is going to end fairly soon. Uh, and it's possible that the bull market in cryptos is going to resume. 
and we'll talk to you next time.